Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence or AI. Specifically, I'm going to say a bit about the nature of AI. I'll then talk about how AI is created. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud AI delivery. An AI may be defined as a computer with a cognitive capacity. And for a very long time, human beings have wished to create such smart machines. However, it wasn't until the 1940s and the 1950s, with the creation of the very first electronic computers, this started to become a remote possibility. And one of the pioneers at the time was Alan Turing, who in 1950 published this paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And in this he proposed an experiment, what he called the imitation game, where you've got people communicating over a text-based interface, and he said, if you could replace one of those people with a computer, and the other people didn't know, they didn't know they were communicating with a computer, not a person, and that machine would be deemed capable of what he called thinking, what we'd now call artificial intelligence. And that idea, what's now known as the Turing test, has been a very powerful marker in AI for a very long time. The idea you should gauge AI by its ability to imitate a human being. However, I think that's a pretty poor test. I see no reason why artificial intelligence AI has to be the same as human intelligence HI. We should judge different forms of intelligence in their own context. So, for example, we know the second most intelligent species on this planet is the dolphin. And we'd never expect a dolphin to be able to imitate a person in a text-based communications exchange. And we wouldn't hold that against the dolphin. We wouldn't deem it not to be intelligent because it couldn't do that. And indeed, even in this paper, Alan Turing did acknowledge it might be a poor test because, as he recognised, a person could not imitate a computer. We would be caught up with, with poor mathematical ability pretty quickly. So if a person can't imitate a computer, why should we judge a computer's intelligence on its ability to imitate a person? Now, I mentioned this at the start of this video because I think it's really important that we get beyond some of the philosophy that holds people back in AI. I put up a video here on this channel about six months or so, I think, about, about Amazon Alexa. And many people wrote in the comments, Alexa is not an AI. Presumably on the basis it can't imitate a human being successfully. And it doesn't matter. I think we have to move on from the philosophy in AI today to move on to the pragmatics, because AI is capable already of doing lots of really impressive things and getting increasingly powerful. So I've said this bit about the, the nature of the philosophy of AI at the start of the video. I'm now going to assume that things like Alexa and other things are AI and get on with how we can practically create AI and how AI can be delivered. There are three basic ways you can create an artificial intelligence. The first is what we could call the rules-based approach. So, for example, if you want a computer to trade for you on the stock market, you can give it all sorts of rules about when it should buy and sell. It can follow those, and that type of expert system is used all the time for things like trading on the stock market. The early AI pioneers also started from a rules-based approach. So, for example, in 1950, this very famous paper was published by a guy called Claude Shannon on programming a computer to play chess. And it was doing that by coming up with all the different rules necessary to allow a computer to play chess. And this does work. However, the problem with a rules-based approach to AI is the world rapidly gets too complicated. There are too many possibilities to work out for the processing power available, the time available, the computer simply gets too slow. So, from the early 1950s onwards, people like Alan Turing decided they needed to use something called heuristics. Now, a heuristic is not a hard rule. It's a sort of rule of thumb. It's a problem-solving shortcut, a reasonable assumption about what you should do. Human beings use them in our lives all the time. And if you can program a computer, you can give it some heuristics, you can avoid it making all the possible calculations it needs to make, and that will speed up the artificial intelligence. So, for example, if you're programming a computer to play chess, you could tell the computer that your opponent is unlikely to make a move which is incredibly stupid, designed to deliberately lose the game. And therefore, you don't have to calculate all the possibilities around your component making incredibly stupid moves. That would be a potential heuristic to use in programming a computer to play chess. Now, one of the people who took this forward in a really big way was a guy called Arthur Samuel, working at IBM in the United States, who was programming a computer to play checkers. And he gave his checkers AI lots of different heuristics. And he ranked this, his heuristics. So he had sort of, you know, rule of thumb one, two, three, four, etc. And he gave them, you know, weights for how they would be applied. 
And over time, he changed these weights, he changed these rankings. And what happened was the AI was set up so if it did well, it remembered which rankings got, did it went well, and if it did badly, it remembered those rankings, it got rid of them. So over time, the rankings got better and better. The system evolved to get smarter. And the other thing Arthur Samuel did, he got copies of these checkers AI to play itself. So they could go through this evolutionary learning cycle faster and faster and faster to get the smartest machine. So that's our second approach to AI, the heuristics approach, the evolutionary learning approach. Give the computer lots of rules of thumb, lots of heuristics, rank them, and over time, make it work out the ones that work best, and you get the smartest possible machine. Having said that, the rules-based approach to AI and the heuristics evolutionary learning approach to AI are no longer the dominant means of development in AI, at least at the moment. Because we moved on to what's called a connectionist approach, we've moved on to artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks are not based upon rules or heuristics, rather they learn by establishing patterns of connection from sample data. And one of the first people to work in this area was a guy called Frank Rosenblatt, who in 1957 published this paper, my third and final paper of the video. And this is all about something called the Perceptron, which they built at Cornell in 1960. And the Perceptron had a load of photo cells, and you could hold up foot-high letters, and it would learn to recognise those letters. So you could hold up lots of versions of a letter A, and eventually it would have learned how to recognise letter A. You could hold up a version of letter A it hadn't seen before, it would recognise it as a letter A, because it established patterns of connections to do that. Now, sometimes people will tell you what's going on in an artificial neural network is just like the way your human brain works. And that's uh, taking things a bit too far. There is some analogy, but it's not a great one. If you look here at a diagram of an artificial neural network, You've got the artificial neurons, the circles in this, which are basically just variables inside a computer, which can have a high value or a low value. And they're all connected together, these artificial neurons, and therefore if you've got neurons with a very high value, lots of them connected to another one, it'll be triggered. Whereas if neurons have got low values, they won't trigger the neurons next to them, they won't establish a pattern. And so basically you've got inputs of a system, this might be data from a camera with pictures for example, then the network in the middle will establish patterns of connection, and that'll create an output. So you might show this system lots of pictures of a particular person, it learned how to recognise that person, you could then trace that person in a load of video files by actually applying this, this particular neural network. The neural net you're looking at here is what you call a deep learning system. And the deep learning neural net has what they call hidden layers, layers of artificial neurons between the inputs and the outputs. So that's the way artificial intelligence is heading, creating these artificial neural networks. And things like DeepMind from Alphabet, part of Google is an artificial neural network system, as is something like Watson from IBM. And these systems work. They're being used now in things like natural language processing, speech recognition, vision recognition, driving autonomous vehicles. They're really a very important part of modern AI. The only thing people don't like about them, potentially, is you can't necessarily work out how they work. Over time, they build patterns of connection. But you can't necessarily look inside at the black box of a system, if you like, see exactly what the computer's doing, the way you can with a rule-based system or even a heuristics-based system. So, for example, if an artificial neural network system is driving an autonomous vehicle and it drives into a person and kills them, you couldn't necessarily open up the coding and say, why did that happen to stop it happening again? You have to trust artificial neural networks more as black box systems compared to rules-based or heuristics AI. Today, the really big thing going on in AI is the development of cloud AI services. In other words, we've got uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM and others delivering AI from the cloud. So you don't have to run AI on your own machines, you can have a fairly dumb computer, a fairly dumb robot that accesses AI from the cloud. You can just plug AI into things these days, and this is a very recent, very powerful development. Now, I made a video all about cloud AI services not that long ago, so I won't go through all the detail of that here. But what I do want to focus on is what is happening to improve cloud AI delivery. And a really interesting development, at least to me, is what's going on at Google with something called TPUs, Tensor Processing Units. Now, traditional computers have inside them what's called a CPU, a central processing unit to do the processing. But unfortunately, CPUs are designed for serial processing rather than parallel processing. 
and yet artificial neural networks, deep learning systems, machine learning, that sort of stuff, that requires massively parallel processing. And so a lot of the pioneers and a lot of the providers have been using graphics card, graphical processing units, GPUs for that processing, but even that's not ideal. So what Google has done is to create these tensor processing units, TPUs. These are optimized to run something called TensorFlow, which is an open source framework for artificial intelligence. And it runs best on these TPUs. And Google's now got developed what is called TPUs 2.0, it's second generation of them. And the first generation of TPUs were very good at running neural nets, but they couldn't do the learning bit. Whereas now TPU 2.0 can do both the learning and the application of that system. And Google is linking these together into what's called TPU pods, and to give very powerful systems for delivering AI from the cloud. And I think the fact that Google is investing so heavily in developing its own processors just to run the best AI for cloud delivery is a really big signal of the way that this industry is going. You know, we're going to see more and more computers accessing remote cloud AI. And in time, even other technologies will come into play. I talked about quantum computing on this channel not that long ago, and potentially quantum computers will offer orders of magnitude more processing power for AIs than we have from even things like TPUs that Google is developing. And beyond that, maybe even we'll see biological computing. I'll do a video on organic computing, DNA computing, call it what you will on this channel fairly soon. And again, that might be the means that we run, we deliver future cloud AI. Over the next few years, AI is going to become a really important computing interface and in turn, a means of accessing many organizations and many online services. If you want to know more about AI and the future of computing, you can look at my brand new book, Digital Genesis, The Future of Computing, Robots and AI, available in both hard copy and on Kindle. And if you go to explaincomputers.com, you can click on the book and download for yourself a free sampler of the preface and part of the first chapter. But now that's it for another video. If you enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Hey.